Gospels of Mark and Luke. We've covered much of the content of the Gospels in Matthew. For all four Gospels, we're going to save the events surrounding the uh, interrogations and crucifixion and resurrection for a separate unit. But for now, we're looking at events in the life of Christ up to that point. And this time, what is there that is different in Mark and Luke? Mark's gospel begins uh, short and to the point, and that is very much the way his gospel is written. His opening words are the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's his point. It's about Jesus, who is the Christ, and he is the Son of God. Mark is the shortest of the gospels. It moves quickly from event to event, not necessarily in chronological order. And this beginning makes it very clear how he's going to present the gospel. Who wrote Mark? There is a character in the New Testament called John Mark, usually just Mark. We learn from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, that this Mark was a close associate of Peter. He writes in his first epistle, Peter writes about Mark and calls him my son. We have a little more information about Mark as an associate of the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. He joins the mission team in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas. He's related to Barnabas. His mother uh, hosts a church in her home, so she was evidently a woman of some means. But in his first mission trip, he decides to head home before it's over, and he deserts the mission. And for some time, Paul is on uh, uneasy terms with him. And yet later, when he writes First Timothy, he says that he wants Mark to come to be with him because he is of much use to him. So there is this character, pretty much the only one that's been suggested as who would have written the Gospel of Mark. You'll remember from our study of Matthew that the four Gospels, do not say within the Gospels who wrote them. So we have to look to how those names came to be attached to them through history. There is some fairly old attestation to Mark writing this Gospel. Papias, a church father who lived around the year 100 and a little later, uh, reportedly, now it is a second-hand report, but reportedly says that Mark wrote what Peter told him. Peter was giving some recollections and Mark wrote it down. This is the quote that goes back to, uh, to the time of almost the time the Apostle John was still alive. And the presbyter, that would be some revered senior church leader, and the presbyter said this, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ, for he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. But afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessities, meaning the necessary elements of the gospel that needed to be recorded. So there's Papias is reporting that Mark was writing what he heard from Peter and that he wrote it accurately, although he never meant to write a chronological biography of Jesus. It should be said that not everyone uh, accepts that at face value, that not everyone accepts that this first century Bible character wrote it, but generally they are people who uh, do not believe that Mark could have uh, included a prophecy of Christ about the destruction of Jerusalem that is is quite particularly accurate in its prediction. So, when was Mark written? It may be as early as the year 50. It's probably the first of the four Gospels. How do you figure when Mark wrote his Gospel? Well, why would we say that it was the first one written? If you compare the content, you see that Mark is almost entirely repeated in Matthew or Luke. The 
Argument is that it is more likely that Matthew and Luke added something to the record of the life of Christ than that Mark would have taken a longer version and omitted or deleted material from that. That if someone were writing a life of Christ, they would not leave out information. They would more likely say, but people also need to know this and add to it. So how, um, how much of Mark is elsewhere? 97% of what is in Mark is also in Matthew. And yet Mark is only a little over half as long as Matthew. 88% of Mark is also in Luke. But again, well over half of um, Mark is, is just barely over half as long as Luke is. So Mark seems to have existed first. Matthew and Luke appear to have incorporated that material, but put additional material in their Gospels. Now, assuming that Mark was first, the dating of his work can work backwards. If you work backwards from Luke-Acts, which is the two-volume work uh, by Luke, we'll talk about that more when we move on to that Gospel, but Luke-Acts can be fairly well dated. The events in Acts abruptly end in about 62. Now, since Luke was written before Acts and it was a two volume uh, publication, then Mark must have been written before uh, 62. And so somewhere in the 50s and to just come up with an arbitrary date, we can say that Mark probably wrote his gospel around A.D. 55. You can calculate that Jesus died in around AD 30, and that would make this very close to the time of the life of Christ. Where was it written? We look at the location of writing sometimes to help us interpret what is the point of this sequence of events or this sequence of speeches. And so now we're looking to see who seems to have been the first group that would have read Mark's gospel. Who was he writing for? Well, it is likely that he was writing for people who lived outside of Palestine, not in Jerusalem, not in uh, Judea, probably not in Samaria. And we say that because as short as the gospel of Mark is, he takes time to explain certain things for his readers. He explains certain elements of Jewish culture that someone in another part of the world might not recognize, such as uh, rituals and, uh, and feast and things like that. Particularly, you can tell that he's writing for people who are not familiar with the Aramaic language. Aramaic is the language that was spoken in Palestine, including the language, uh, a, a, a cognate language of Hebrew, the language that the Jewish people would have spoken. And so when Mark is reporting some things that Jesus says, he uses these Aramaic, that is the mother tongue that Jesus would have spoken, these Aramaic words, but he goes on and says, let me translate that for you, or let me tell you what that means. For example, when he uh, gives a name to uh, James and John because of their uh, alpha male personalities, he calls them sons of thunder. But first, the way that Mark reports it is that they were called Boanger, Boanerges, uh, a word in Aramaic that it was uh, foreign to those who would have read it in the first place. So he translates it. In telling a, a miracle with a little girl, he says in Aramaic, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Mark actually says this phrase, which means this. Uh, when he uses the word korban, that is where people say that they can't give something because they have dedicated it to God. He stops and, and translates for the reader, korban, that is given to God. When he is healing a person who cannot speak, he uses an Aramaic word. Jesus says, in Aramaic. And those who were originally reading it, not knowing Aramaic, need a translation. And so, Mark says, that is, be opened. We read in uh, the 14th chapter, Jesus 
praying to the Father, and he uses the Aramaic word Abba for Father. Most people are familiar with the words of Jesus on the cross, but they are in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What we're noticing is that we can tell that the people that Mark originally writes for didn't know Aramaic because he has to quote it and then say, which means, and then put it in their language. Of course, he didn't put it into English. He put it into Greek, which was the common language of educated people in the Roman Empire. He also uses Latin forms for some words. Uh, when he talks about the widow giving her tiny donation, when he praises her for giving all that she had, he says that she gave two lepta, and that's a, a term using Jerusalem coinage. And so he tells them what that's equal to, he says, which is a quadrant. And so he's telling them what the Roman equivalent currency would be, or coin, coinage. Also, uh, when he talks about Jesus being led around for his interrogations, he says that they led him into the courtyard, or depending on your translation, maybe palace. But he's really uh, using the term that they would have used in Palestine, but he goes on and explains to them in a term that they would have used in Latin, the praetorium, the uh, abode of the praetor. And so all this being put together, and considering the possibility that uh, the tradition is true, that Mark was writing at the dictation of Peter, and assuming that the tradition is true that Peter would have been in Rome by that time, a likely place of writing is Rome. Here are the main sections of Mark. It moves rapidly. As we mentioned, it's the shortest of the four Gospels. It moves from event to event. And the arrangement of the material seems to be more thematic than chronological. Now, he does have the general chronology that the first six chapters talk about the arrival of Jesus and the beginning of his ministry in Galilee. But then we see a few chapters where Jesus is expanding his ministry. He travels some. He carries disciples with him. Then by the time we get to the middle of the book, chapters 8 through 10, Jesus is beginning to reveal his identity and the fact that he will be making his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. So that then, all the way from chapter 11 through chapter 16, the text is about Jesus going up to Jerusalem the final time and the things that happen there at the end of his earthly life. Here are themes in Mark. Jesus is the divine son of God. That's how Mark introduces him. As we said in the very first verse, he is the Christ, or in the terminology that the Jews might have used, the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the great one that has been promised to come and rescue God's people. But in no uncertain terms, Mark starts out his gospel saying he is the Son of God. He goes on to say that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. There's something more uh, close to God than uh, St. John the Baptist, who did not baptize with the Holy Spirit. And we have repeated here what we uh, see elsewhere, that when Jesus is baptized, the voice of God comes down from heaven and says, this is my son whom I love. So packed right into the first chapter in several different ways. The theme is that Jesus is the divine son of God. Then, as Mark proceeds through his gospel, he shows through miracles that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Oddly, it is often demons or evil spirits who recognize who Jesus is. The suggestion is that from the spirit world, they would have known who Jesus was from before he entered the world. And so we have demons or evil spirits calling Jesus the Holy One of God the Son of God, the Son of the Most High God. Of course, Jesus doesn't want them, them to be his witnesses, but we have that insight that Mark records that people heard these 
evil spirits, these demons, announcing who Jesus is. And without going into all of the miracles, uh, it is vivid in the book of Mark that Jesus astonishes people when he performs various kinds of miracles. In addition, Mark records direct claims that Jesus is the divine Son of God. When he and his disciples are criticized about not observing the Sabbath by the strict traditions of the elders, he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That's a pretty high claim among Jewish people. At the Transfiguration, we are reminded, as we've read elsewhere, that a voice from heaven declares, this is my Son, whom I love. At the end of his earthly life, the high priest asked Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus answers, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. As I'm sure you know, the high priest takes this to be blasphemy, a claim to be on level with God, and so Jesus actually makes that claim. And the report of the crucifixion in Mark ends with a centurion saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Number one theme in the book of Mark is in, in many different ways, Mark presents that Jesus is the Son of God. It shows up particularly in Mark, not uniquely in Mark, but particularly in Mark, that Jesus sometimes discourages public announcements of his identity. For some time, people considered this one of the most significant elements of Mark and called it the Messianic secret. Uh, some more recent uh, scholars have said it's there, but it's not exactly the central point of the book. Examples are, as we mentioned, and you see some references there, when demons are announcing who Jesus is, he hushes them. He certainly would not want uh, his witnesses to be demons. When the crowds are growing so large that he can't accomplish his mission, when they're even wearing him out, Jesus has to withdraw. And we have several accounts where he does that. He's not there just to draw a crowd and just to do miracles. In those circumstances, he is reported as, as telling people, don't, don't spread who I am. And then we see several times when Jesus says to his disciples, uh, particularly in, ver in chapters 8 and 9, he tells the disciples, this is who I am, but don't tell anybody yet. And the context tells us that the concern of Jesus is that they don't fully understand who Jesus is yet. And yet, we do need to balance that with an example that Jesus does sometimes tell people to go and tell what the Lord has done when he did a miracle. Uh, perhaps not the emphasis on Jesus being the Christ, but there are times when he wants it spread. But frequently, he tells people, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell who I am. And of course, like all the Gospels, uh, absolutely vital theme is that Jesus came to die and to rise from death. There is just a hint of what will happen to Jesus as early as Mark chapter 2, verse 20. Verse, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, increasingly, though, he begins emphasizing the coming crucifixion and the resurrection uh, in chapters 8, 9, and 10. He is foretelling this treatment and this victory. And notice that six of Mark's 16 chapters are covering the end of the life of Jesus on earth. I want you to see or to take notice of one thing about the ending of Mark. You should be aware that scholars disagree on what is the last verse in the Gospel of Mark. 
It's one of only a handful of passages where there is some question as to whether uh, Bibles today all carry the original text. The question here seems to be whether something was added to Mark after Mark finished writing his gospel. It is a question, though. It's not an absolute. Most scholars today, even many conservative Bible-believing scholars, suggest that Mark chapter 16, verse 8, is the last of the verses that Mark wrote. There are others who would include verses 9 through 20 as the ending that Mark wrote. The question is about how many of the oldest existing manuscripts of Mark, how many of them include verses 9 through 20? By most calculations, the weight of the evidence is that these verses were appended to his gospel after Mark had completed his gospel. I want to repeat that not everyone accepts this conclusion. One argument is that if verse 8 is the end, we hear that when uh, they learn of the resurrection, the last thing that said is, and they were afraid, which hardly sounds like how you would end the gospel. The other disagreement is on how do you count old manuscripts? How do you know which one is a copy of a copy of a copy? Uh, and that is a complicated issue. All that being said, the content of Mark 16, 9 through 20 is completely consistent with the rest of the New Testament. It doesn't contradict. It teaches things that are taught in the New Testament. The question is, to, is not has this long been preserved as a part of Scripture, but has this always been a part of the Gospel of Mark? Moving on to Luke's gospel. The starting of the gospel of Luke is quite significant. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, he tells Theophilus, I've checked all the sources and I want to put down in order uh, what we believe. Now, as we mentioned, he also wrote the book of Acts. And the beginning of Acts says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. He, he himself connects the two books, Luke and Acts. But what is significant about Luke is that he starts out saying, I'm going to give you an orderly account. I'm going to check with people who are actually there. Uh, he is uh, telling someone, Theophilus, that he has checked out the story of Christ, and this is what the story really is. The author is generally agreed to be Luke, who is uh, referred to in the New Testament as the beloved physician. He is a traveling companion of Paul on his missionary journeys, and he is the author of Acts. The earliest known references uh, to Luke as author go back as far as a an early list of which are the books of the New Testament, the Muratorian fragment that dates 170, or a reference by an early church father, uh, Irenaeus, in about 180. Because Acts abruptly ends with Paul in prison, and because Luke gives us so much information about what was going on or among different uh, rulers he gives us the best dating we have for what happened in the time of Jesus in the time of the book of Acts. Much of the book of Acts is about the missionary journeys of Paul, and he is building up and building up and building up, and you wonder at the end of the book, what's going to happen to Paul? And it stops without telling you what happens to Paul, which logically leads to the conclusion that Paul had not been condemned or acquitted by the time the book of Acts was written. Putting together historical details that we do have, we can come uh, to the conclusion that uh, Paul probably was let out of prison in Rome in the early 60s. And so if we know when Acts was written, 
in the early 60s. Then some time had to have passed when he had previously written his gospel, which he says in the opening of Acts he had already done. So we come up with a date of around 60. Uh, where it was written, it's quite likely it was written in Rome. At least Acts was, because that's he's with Paul, and that's where Paul is at the end of Acts. So Rome is a good guess for where Luke was written. Here's our outline of Luke. We learned that Jesus was about 30 when he started his public ministry. But Luke gives a considerable amount of attention to material that happened before that time. We have most of what we know as the nativity story from Luke, quite a bit from Matthew, but more from Luke. In these first four chapters, we read about uh, extensively about the uh, the birth and childhood of Jesus, the birth and childhood and mission of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus. His genealogy is in that part as well. In the next section, uh, as the Gospels do, he presents Jesus preaching in Galilee, chapters 4 through 9. And there is a constant play between proclaiming the Gospel in coming into conflict with the religious establishment. It is an unfolding of the identity of Jesus in these chapters four through nine. You'll notice that a section is highlighted uh, with a green mark around it. The section toward Jerusalem is a long section from the end of chapter nine uh, through the end of chapter 19. We're told there that Jesus uh, steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. And so in the time that it takes for him to travel from Galilee to Jerusalem, the last time, we read a great deal of information in Luke about his travels down, uh, down south of Galilee and then up the mountain to Jerusalem. And as he's traveling along, he's making these predictions, telling his close disciples that he will be uh, arrested and that he will be crucified and that he will rise from the dead. And so you have this long section with much material that's not in the other Gospels about Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And then you have Luke's presentation of the final week of, of Jesus in his earthly life. He comes in with great fame in triumph, and that immediately leads to conflict. He observes the Passover, and then he is arrested and unfairly interrogated. That's all the Gospels do. Luke goes on to tell the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. And of course, finally, his resurrection. That's how Luke is organized. Here are subjects that Luke presents. One theme is that the mission of Jesus reaches beyond the Jews. Now, it's not explicitly stated that way, but when you look at how much is emphasized, how much is included, that is beyond the Jews, that is in the Gentile world, among the nations, you do see that it is a theme of the Gospel of Luke. Both Matthew and Luke give genealogies of Jesus. There are places where they're not alike, but if you trace anybody's family tree, you can see at this point they're following a, a mother's line, at this point they're following a father's line, but they're all Jewish, so they're all related. So there's, there's not any reason uh, to say there's a conflict in those minor differences. But the biggest difference between Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel and their genealogies of Jesus is that Matthew emphasizes that Jesus is the descendant of David, the great king of the Jews, and Abraham, the father of the Jews. In contrast to that, Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. That is, identifying Jesus with all of humanity, Adam the father of all people. 
Also, we can put together that Luke dates the life of Jesus in terms of Roman officials. So when he is surveying the life of Christ, he is telling us that Jesus was here at a real time in a real place in a real society. Luke often uh, on several occasions mentions some Old Testament people who were not Israelites. And this is something that the other gospels do not do. There's a story that Luke includes in the nativity that's not in the other gospels. And that is when there's a man, there are actually two, Anna, a woman, and, and then separately Simeon, a man, who are at the temple when Jesus is brought in as a baby boy. And this Simeon has been told that he won't die before he sees the deliverer, the, the Messiah. And when he sees young Jesus, he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He is looking to what had always been the mission of God's chosen people, the people of Israel, which was to be a light to the Gentiles. But this Simeon is inspired to recognize that in this little boy who will grow up to be Jesus Christ, that what God has done is for all nations. It will reveal God to Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish people, at the same time that it will be a glory to God's people, Israel. Jesus is presented as the Savior of the whole world. The end of the Gospel of Luke has his account of the commission to the followers to spread the gospel. Jesus speaks to his disciples, and the wording is this. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The emphasis is that the gospel is to be, and forgiveness is to be preached, not just to the Jews, but to all nations. He picks up that same theme in the opening of the book of Acts, where he says that the apostles will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Luke presents God at work in the early life of Jesus. God sends an angel to announce the birth of John the Baptist, and God sends an angel to announce the birth of Jesus to Mary. Mary is inspired to praise God in response in what's come to be known as the Magnificat. We learn from Luke that shepherds come to see the baby Jesus. And as we mentioned, both Anna and Simeon praise the child Jesus. We see in the book of Luke, more than we see anywhere else, that young Jesus is involved with God, uh, even before he grows into manhood. Another theme that stands out in the Gospel of Luke is that women are significantly involved in the ministry of Jesus. In the account of his birth and infancy, we see women prominent. Elizabeth, that is, the mother of John the Baptist and the relative of Mary, Mary herself, Anna the prophetess, all prominent in the birth and infancy narratives. We're also told in Luke that there was a group of women who traveled with Jesus and the apostles, and that those women supported his ministry, uh, most likely financially supported his ministry. There's a time when Jesus goes to the house of Mary and Martha, who are sisters. Martha's busy doing housewifey type things, and Mary just wants to sit and listen to Jesus. And when Martha says, tell her to come help me in the kitchen kind of thing, Jesus praises Mary because she stopped working so she could learn from him. Luke also emphasizes women in the gospel story when he shows that women are the first to learn of the resurrection and to tell the apostles. 
This has been a rather short presentation. We've had to cut a lot short because we've been behind. I want you to be aware, as it's noted in Blackboard, that your Unit 1 exam will not include a lecture on specific passages from Mark and Luke. However, as the syllabus says, you are to know the content of Mark 3, 6 through 21, Mark 7, 31 through 37, and in Luke, chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, 13, 17 and 18. Read those and be very familiar with them. There will be some questions on the exam, just content questions of what is in those passages. Your exam should be available on Sunday, May the 27th. It is due on Monday, May the 28th. And that's it for this presentation. That's it for the presentations that will be included on Unit 1 exam.